Would you mind if you can please come forward because we have such a small team. <clears throat> Shall we start? Good afternoon. Uh, unfortunately, we have a very small number, but I can assure you after this session, when you will go back to your class and you will interact with your fellow students, you will tell them that you have missed out something. Okay, yeah, inshallah. So, my name is Junaid, and we are here from SIDF, Saudi Industrial Development Fund. As you may know, my colleague, Michelle Haridan, he is also going to accompany us. But as you know, today we are going to speak about logistics. But where is the pointer? Thank you. But before I move on, would you mind if you can take out a paper and write one line or one word or anything in terms of whatever you know about logistics or supply chain? Just a single word or single line, you know? Or it will help you at the end of this discussion. Okay, and since you are sparing some time out of your busy schedule, what is your expectation from this session? So you are going to invest your valuable one hour over here. What is your expectation from this class? What is your hope that at the end of this session, what you are going to take away from this room? So just a single line or word or anything that you know about this industry. Okay. I'll give you a minute and then we will move on. Anything, okay? Okay? Whatever you know and whatever your expectations are. Done. So I'm sure that when you were coming here, there might be some questions in your mind that what is logistics, what is supply chain, what is the difference between logistics and supply chain, how it relates to the market, uh, how it will add value to the ecosystem, and what I'm going to learn out of this session. So I'm sure those questions were in your mind, isn't it? Don't you think that those are your most relevant questions? Yeah? Can you see? Yeah, is it okay? So the agenda of our today's meeting is very simple. That by the end of this session, I want you to be aware of this thing, which is the fundamentals of this industry, the importance of logistics industry, and SIDF role in the development of logistics sector in Saudi Arabia. Okay? This is my core objective for today's session. And what we will be learning today, that you will know what is logistics and supply chain, how it's relevant. And the bigger picture is from a global perspective. I'll give you an insight about the size of this industry, its global perspective, and the prospects of this industry. Okay. Is it clear? Any questions at this stage? Is it clear? This is what we are going to focus on. So as most of you um, study in any subject about the history from where it all originated, so the basic of logistics is it goes back to the Roman empires. When Roman empires were uh, leading the world, they had officers, they were known as logisticas. And those officers were responsible to transport the ammunition, food supply, and the other useful items to the military. It was the job of those logisticas to move the material within the armed forces. Okay? And that's how the word logistics is driven. Okay? But 
when the Industrial Revolution came in the 18th and the 19th century, the logistics importance started becoming critical, whereby things were moving from one location to another, wheel was invented by then, things were moving from city to city, but it was still very unstructured. Things were just happening without any structured approach. The real game changer was the Second World War. In 1940s, during the Second World War, when the Germans were conquering the whole Europe and going all the way to Russia, what was their biggest strength? Why they were dominating the entire Europe and um, almost getting close to Russia? The biggest strength was logistics, that they were able to get the right goods at the right time to the militaries, whether it was food, whether it was ammunition, or whether it was any necessary tool that the army was in need. So the real game changer was the Second World War. And after the Second World War, when the things were calmed down, the industry has realized that if in military this practice is there for many, many years, why can't we introduce these practices in commercial sectors at the same time? Why can't we promote this industry within the commercial areas as well? So that's how the logistics industry was commercially recognized. So if you look at engineering, whether industrial engineering, mechanical, civil, you have a long history. But when you look at logistics and supply chain, this concept was de developed only in the last 30, 40 years. In fact, if I can recall correctly, in 1982, there was a gentleman called Oliver. He used the word supply chain management for the very first time. Before that, it wasn't even exist. So this industry is very young. We don't have many professionals. We don't have many established frameworks for this industry. And it is going through a continuous evolution. Okay? Is it clear? Yeah? So as I was telling you, after the Second World War, until 1960s, if you look at it, within the commercial sector, within the manufacturing, trading, all those functions were working independently. Material planning, forecasting, sourcing, warehousing, transportation, distribution, everything was working in its own little silo. There was no merger as one department. Everything was working independently until late 1960s. Then come the 80s whereby things start getting some sort of a consolidation and all those demand planning, supply planning, forecasting fall under the management called material management. Still, if you go to many industries, especially those who come from Germany, you use this, you, you hear this term material management department. Okay? Many German companies still use this term within their organization, material management department. And the role of is, this department is basically to do the demand planning, supply planning, forecasting, replenishment. All those functions are managing by material management department. So all these little silos were consolidated by 1980s as material management. Then the warehousing, value-added services, all this were consolidated under warehousing function. And transportation was consolidated under physical distribution umbrella. In 1990s, this entire function was merged as logistics. But at the same time, the data become a challenge because your data was growing with the passage of time. And simultaneously, they have realized that on one hand, if you improve your logistics, then you have to improve your marketing at the same time. And that's how the supply chain management department was created or the industry was created. Okay? So it was only developed in 2000. Okay? Now, if I can sum up this slide into this simple picture, this is what the supply chain management is. It's taking the goods from the factory or from the plants all the way 
to the consumers or to the retailers. Okay. So in a nutshell, supply chain is basically a phenomena and logistics is a branch of supply chain management. So still many people are confused outside this room whereby they are contradicting between supply chain and logistics, but actually logistics is a branch of supply chain management. Supply chain management is a whole set of functions whereby you do the planning, forecasting, procurement, warehousing, distribution, all those set of activities you perform under supply chain management. Okay. So a supply chain manager or supply chain director is responsible for a lot of activities, but a logistics manager, his core focus is warehousing and distribution. Is that clear? Any could yeah, please. Can a supply, uh, a supply chain manager uh, do a logistics work? Of course, it's under his responsibility. So a supply chain manager, he's responsible for this part as well as for this part. So everything function under his umbrella. He is the head of the department. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, what do you mean by B2B? Okay. So as I said, from source to the end user, the end user can be a retailer or a consumer. Consumer means we. So B2B means business to business and B2C means business to consumer. Like if you look at Amazon, Amazon is selling to you as well as they are selling probably to Pandas or maybe they are selling to Jafali, anybody. Anybody can buy from Amazon, right? So if Amazon is dealing with Jafali or Abdul Latif Jamil, this is B2B. If they're dealing with us, this is B2C, business to consumer, okay? So is it clear for you between what is supply chain management and what is logistics? So if anybody can ask you to differentiate between supply chain and logistics, would you be able to do so now? Yeah, you understand the concept. Yeah, yes. good. So if I can elaborate a bit more on that, this is, you have multiple suppliers. So take an example of a company like Procter & Gamble, or Unilever, or L'Oreal, or Racket Bank Kaiser, Almarai, Toyota, any company that comes to your mind, they have a lot of different suppliers. And from all these different suppliers, the products, whether it's raw material or packing material, it goes to different factories. Those factories could be at one location or at multiple locations, right? And from those factories, after the production, it goes to the main distribution center or to the main warehouses. From those warehouses, the product goes out to the branches, as I explained you, the retail segment or directly to the consumer, okay? But as you can see, there is reverse also. So in logistics, the customer service is very important. So let's say you buy something from Amazon and you're not happy with the product. You just give them a call, they come and pick up the stock from your doorstep and take it back to the warehouse. This reverse logistics is a part of supply chain management also. For you, it is a simple return of product. But if you look from an Amazon perspective, it is a complete supply chain management of reverse logistics. So the stock that goes out from the warehouse, now it is entering back inside the warehouse. The inventory will increase again. The value of the stocks will go up again. You know? So you have to look at those things very, very carefully when you have returns. Is that clear? Yes. Any questions? Good. Now, in logistics, when we talk about the delivery touch points, it's very, very important, okay? Now, I want you to think from a business perspective that if you are working in any organization, how many points you will touch from a logistics perspective, okay? I'll give you an example here. For example, you have to send your trucks or you have to assign somebody to pick up the raw material for your factory, right? So somebody has to go and bring the raw material to the factory. That's a logistics. 
then you have to send the trucks to pick up the raw packing material from different factories. Two, then it goes to your main factory where the main production goes on. Then from those factories, the stock will go to the main distribution center or to the main warehouse. And from there, it goes to the distributors, retailers, and then to consumers. I'll give you a practical example so you will understand. Think of a brand like Almarai. We deal with those products on daily basis, right? Almarai is buying on daily basis raw material from different companies in Saudi Arabia as well as from overseas. This is purely logistics function, right? That they are buying continuously raw material from different sources. Packing material, they're also buying. When all those material comes in, it goes where? To the main production site, where they produce those milk and dairy products. After the production, once they produce the finished goods, they have to transfer the finished goods to the main warehouse or to the main distribution center. From this main distribution center, the products will be loaded on their trucks and it goes to the main distributors. Main distributors are in each city. So for example, you have one um, guy who's buying in Joomla, you know, in wholesale. And then he's distributing in the neighborhood market. Right? So all this complex supply chain and complex logistics is basically, is a multi-layer of handling of products by which we get our daily supplies, okay? Whether it's Almarai or any other product that you name it. So this is a typical flow of the products from which the products pass through and reaches to our hands. Okay? Any questions, any confusion? So when we talk about logistics, the movement of products, the movement uh, of goods, eventually the question that comes to our mind, who is providing all these services? There must be somebody like here, you have a professor who's coming here and giving you a service and helping you to learn something every day. Within the logistics, it's the same thing. When you want to move your products, the questions comes to your mind, that who will take my products from my factory to the consumers or to the market? Like you go to a mall and you see hundreds of products there. Or you see a food court whereby people are making McDonald's burgers and Burger King and all that. But from where do get, they get all those supplies? Who is bringing all those supplies just in time to make sure that products are always available to meet the needs of the customer? So this is how the logistics industry is divided into different set of service providers who are giving services. So the basic team who provide the service, we call them 1PL, then we have 2PL, then we have three, four LLPs and VNCs. Today I will try to help you to understand up to 4PL level, so which will give you a very good insight of how this industry works, okay? So what is 1PL? How many of you are familiar with those brand names like Del Monte, Mars, Nahadi, Toshiba, and all those brands, you know? Exactly. We all deal with those companies on a daily basis. Most of these companies have a department within their organization, and that department basically provides them the services. Okay? So, for example, uh, let's take an example of Nahdi. Okay. In Nahdi, you have a head office which is responsible to buy all the pharma and other supplies. Once they buy all these items, it goes to their main warehouse. That warehouse belongs to Nahdi, right? And from that warehouse, Nahdi own people will take the products from warehouse to branches wherever Nahdi branches are, okay? That's mean everything Nahdi is doing by themselves. They're not depending on any third party. 
Everything they are doing by themselves, they have their own resources, whether it's trucks, people, warehouses, everything is in-house. When you have everything in-house, then you call it 1PL, when it's everything is captive. You get an idea? So inshallah ta'ala, once you will be graduated, going to the industry, when you visit any organization or you work in any organization, the moment you see they are doing everything by themselves from a logistics perspective, you should be able to understand that they are classified as 1PL from an industry perspective. Okay? Is that clear? So what is 2PL now? So I'll take example of the same Nahadi. So let's say now Nahadi have a huge warehouse. They have their own people, they have their own resources, everything owned by Nahdi. However, now we are entering into a Ramadan season. The seasonality is coming in. Hajj season is coming in. And they are buying a lot of new products. They are building up the inventory. To build up the inventory, their warehouse is full now. What do they do in that case? They will go to a, another company and ask them to give me a building only just an empty space and we will manage our own show. Okay, so that company who will provide them the assets only, we call them the two PLs. They are the real estate developers or real estate providers for the logistics industry. Okay, their job is not to provide them the service but only to provide them the assets. Is that clear? Or maybe in a scenario like Nahdi want to deliver a lot of product to their branches, but they don't have trucks. So they will go to Budget or Avis or Henko or Key Rent a Car and tell them we need to take 50 trucks from you for one year. So Budget or Avis and all those leasing companies will provide them only trucks. Not people, not service, only the equipment. So Budget and Avis in that case become a 2PL. Okay, so 2PL are those companies who provide only assets and equipments. Functionally, they are not involved. Operationally, they are not involved. Their job is to provide an assets on an agreed time frame basis. Okay, so 1PL is clear, 2PL is clear, and now let's say we have a unique service provider, which is we call it third party logistic service provider. Third party logistic service provider means, let's take an example of Nahdi. Uh, let's say Nahdi have got a huge warehouse in Riyadh. They have invested a lot in Riyadh, but now they don't want to invest their own money in Jeddah. And they have a lot of business in Jeddah. So they will come to some established logistics company and ask them, that would you mind if you can build up resources for me? I will tell you what exactly I need. I need maybe 10,000 square meter facility, I need 50 people, I need 10 trucks, but you will do everything for me. Your system, IT system, and my IT system will be integrated. We will demand our services on the system, which will flow to your organization, and you will serve us. Is this outsourcing? Absolutely, that was, I was about to say. It is an outsourcing of function, okay? So for example, in your university, um, let's say there is a department which is newly established, but you don't have resources to uh, get your right uh, education for that department. But maybe in, for instance, Nuala University, you have a very established department. An MOU gets signed between your university and Princess Nuala, and you guys go to Princess Nuala University to get your educational services. In that case, Fassi University has outsourced to Nura University. So this outsourcing concept is very common in logistics. And why it is so common? That you don't want to build your own resources. You want to remain lean, okay? As we say, you don't want to build so much fat on your bones. You have to be always lean as an organization to constantly serve. 
So, 1 PL, 2 PL, 3 PL concept, is it clear to you? Any questions? And what is 4 PL? 4 PL means fourth party logistic service provider. They are assetless. Okay? They are very asset light organization. Their job is to provide services with an advanced technology. So, let us go back to an example of Nahadi. So, Nahadi will say uh, that I have my own warehouses, I have my transportation. In Jeddah, I have a third party service provider, so forth. But I need a company who will provide me a one stop solution. Okay? In that case, let us say Haifa will be the fourth party logistic service provider. She does not have a warehouse, she does not have enough resources, trucks, or anything. But she has built capabilities in terms of technology within, within her organization with few people. So what Nahadi will do, she will send, they will send the request to Haifa and Haifa will manage it for them. She knows where to uh, allocate the orders to which companies, from where to buy the services. So anything which Nahadi wants to outsource to a company who will buy the services for them, or source the right partners for them, we call them 4PL, four four fourth party logistic service provider. It is a very common uh, way of working in Europe. Like in Europe, you don't have many companies who build assets and uh, resources, but they have good technology. And with the help of technology, they serve their customers. Okay? They know from where to allocate and where to find the right partners. Is it clear? So I'm just trying to keep it simple for you to understand. So inshallah, when in future you will be in the market, you will be able to, whenever you walk in any organization, you need to figure out whether this company is relying on 1PL model, 2PL model, 3PL model, or 4PL model. If you grasp this idea, that will be a lot for you as a beginner in any organization. Yes, please. Which partner Very good question. So if you are an organization with lot of volume within your organization, like Al Marai or Nahdi or anything who has got enough business within in house then I would say go for your own captive business model approach. But if you are SME, small medium enterprise, and you don't want to jeopardize your cash into assets and in resources and take lot of responsibilities, outsource it. But make sure that your management is smart enough to identify the right partner. If you cannot do so, then go to the 4PL, who will find out for you the right partner. Right? In that case, 4PL will be your right approach to help you. Yes, please. I think uh, sometimes some companies prefer to just focus on their core competencies. Absolutely. And then they just uh, matter of cash, matter of like they're very efficient in their work, and then they can focus just if this activity is not sensitive to their business. Hundred percent, Professor is spot on that some companies are so focused on their core business that they don't want to get into logistics. However, this phenomena, this concept is in practice in more mature markets. Okay? It can happen where you have hundreds of service providers. Okay? Now, I'm thinking from Saudi perspective, I'm sharing with you my knowledge from Saudi perspective, that Saudi Arabia is going through an evolution whereby we don't have many service providers, we don't have much expertise here in the local market. That is why all those big names are building capabilities in-house, so they don't have to depend outside. But if you go to a market like China, UK, Germany, Singapore, nobody is building up their unnecessary resources. They focus on their core competencies and rest is outsourced. Right? Is that clear? But your question is very valid. Which is the right model? The answer is very simple. Depends on the scale of your business. Okay. I have another 
please. I'm going to give you a command. So yeah. how I have a black spot. Okay. And during transportation, uh, I always have a lot of losses in the car, in the final car. So would it be a smart move to go and find a third party that if there's any losses in my car, I can ensure that they're going to give me a uh, pay me back? Would it be a smart move or should I just stay with my own and just report? So your good name is? Arib, Arib, very good and very practical question. However, within your question there is a slight confusion. Okay, if you have so much damages and it, the frequency is so high, the factory. Sorry. During transportation only, exactly. So, as an organization, you need to look back about the value-added services. So you have sourced a very good raw material, you have packed them very well, you have made a very nice glass and everything. But where the things are going wrong? Look, transportation company is making only two to three percent profit at the end of the day. So if he make a business of let's say 100,000 real, two percent means 2,000 real only. And if you are giving constantly uh, credit notes request to him, he will be bankrupt very soon, right? Yeah. So a smart logistics company are always start with a good service level agreement, okay? So I will not take a responsibility for your mistakes. So as a good organization from a logistics company perspective, you need to make sure that I'm dealing with a very delicate product, very sensitive products. Is this glass factory giving me in a good packaging? What are the practices in loading? Because as a transport company, I just go there and pick up the goods. Your factory is loading the goods on my truck. Okay? However, the negligence can become my responsibility if do I do not provide the right loading equipment inside my truck yeah so as a company now you can blame me that i don't have the right tools inside my truck which are equipped to take the glass products okay so that is why in logistics now this is a debate that we have which gives a thought that logistics is all about win-win partnerships okay as an organization you cannot always blame me and I will not always blame you. If we have this relationship, the business will suffer. The essence of success for any organization is in win-win partnership. That you will make money, so I will make money. Is that clear? Yes, Absolutely. Yeah. I'll give you a very funny and a real life scenario. Long time back, I was asked to move. Uh, sorry to quote you if you have any association with that brand, Nescafe. Okay? I was asked to move a trailer of Nescafe from Jeddah to Riyadh. Okay. Simple. But at that point, the issue was that we were short of trucks. So what was our approach? That it's a simple business. Call one 4PL company like Haifa. 
and ask Haifa that Haifa, I need immediately one truck to move Nescafe from Jeddah to Riyadh. And Haifa does not own any truck. So she call in the market and see who has got the right truck. And she sent the driver to our organization. And our organization load the truck and that truck went smoothly from Jeddah to Riyadh. After 24 hours, I received a call that you guys will see us in the court of law. Why, what's happened? Everything is okay or what? They found the animal feed within the truck. And we were like shocked that we loaded a sealed truck. How come there was animal feed inside the truck? What's happened basically, that the driver who came from Haifa Channel, he was an idiot, basically. He received an order for Gassim to take animal feed. So he thought that, OK, I will drop Nescafe. And on top of Nescafe cartoons, I'll put some stock of animal feed. And after loading cafe, I will go straight to Gassim. Okay. Whose mistake is it? It's neither me, nor Haifa, nor whom you will blame, that poor driver in the middle. Okay? What was his interest? Maybe two, three hundred real, that's it. But the penalty came as a half a million dollar. Now, this is where the win-win partnership makes an important role, that you need to have strong checks. As strong partnerships you can develop, as strong service level, Agreements you can sign, you can safeguard your business. You can minimize the risk. Okay? And the essence is only in your documentation. As good documentation you have, you can safeguard your risk. Otherwise, may Allah protect. Okay? Sure. This means that the responsibility of the supplier finishes at the seaport or at the warehouse. For instance, there are some agreements in that you are protected against it. And we know that the product is insured by some part, either the supplier or the customers. And then the agreement is clear. But it depends. You have to know what are the means of insuring, and then you have to. What's the agreement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is it clear? Shall we move on? So this is the industry segmentation. So if you guys are from engineering background, so you know once you enter <coughs> in your BE life, you have a choice whether you want to go in mechanical, electrical, industrial, civil, whatever. Similarly, in the logistics industry, we have segmentation. So there are people who are working in the rail freight. Okay, lot of cargo moves by rail. So there are people who are specialized in the movement of goods by rail. Then there are people who are responsible to move the goods by sea, air, land. And then we have people who are responsible to move small items like postal and courier services, like um, Saudi Postal Services, Amazon. You know, Amazon is an e-commerce company, but indirectly they are managing a lot of postal and courier services. DHL, FedEx, UPS, all those companies are specialized in this segment. Then we have infrastructure developer companies who are responsible only to build facilities, like at the seaport, airport, border terminals, so infrastructure developers. Then we have people who are specialized in airport or seaport handling. Um, so if any one of you from Jeddah or Dammam, and if you're passing by the seaport, you see a lot of cranes, you know, those are maneuvering the containers. Have you noticed that? Yeah? Or if you're in Dubai, maybe you see a lot of uh, cranes at the seaport are maneuvering those containers. Or if you go at, uh, for example, even at Riyadh Airport, you see a lot of cargo is handling on the ground. Okay? So there are companies who are specialized in the handling of cargo at sea or at the airport terminals. 
Then we have third party logistic service providers who are responsible to provide warehousing and transportation services. So this is the overall segmentation of the logistics industry. Once you get graduated, inshallah ta'ala, you have a choice if you want to pursue your career, you can build your career in any of that industry vertical. And it's very promising, highly paid, and very bright prospects in this industry. Yeah? With a lot of international exposure and experience. So this picture, basically, if you stand in the middle, I'm sorry, you will see the logistics is going all around us for 24 by 7. Okay. As they say, when you are born, you're born with chemistry. When you die, you die with chemistry. Right? It's the same thing. When you're born, the logistics start. The nurse came in and put a barcode on the child's hand. That's the tracking starts. For hospital, it's not a child, it's an inventory. And that's how the industry works. Yeah? So that's how the entire tracking system and monitoring system works in the logistics industry. So giving you a global overview, this industry is over $16 trillion by 2026. So you can imagine the depth in this industry. Alone in Saudi Arabia, our market size within the next couple of years will be over $50 billion. Okay? It's a huge market. That's, that is why all eyes on Saudi Arabia, and everybody wants to take a share of that $50 billion. That's why many multinationals are putting focus on Saudi Arabia. But let me tell you, still, it's a very, very small industry. We have a potential to become three times of that in the next few years, okay, if things are, goes right. But it's a huge industry in Saudi Arabia. So according to the World Bank, logistics is not only important for organization, it is a backbone for the countries. With the help of logistics, you build infrastructures, you create jobs, you provide opportunities for the people to go. Indirectly, the logistics provide an opportunity to uplift the quality of life at the masses. Okay? Because it is one segment that can create a lot of job opportunities. So inshallah, once you will be in the field, you will see that in any organization, the biggest workforce you will find in the logistics department. Yes, there are a lot of blue collar jobs like drivers, warehouse workers, but at the same time, you have a very strong senior management at the top. Okay, and you need those senior guys who are highly educated and experienced to run big complex organizations. So even the World Bank, the United Nations recognize the importance of the logistics sector. So in a nutshell, if you want to know that what is the contribution of logistics, it helps in GDP. So if, as I said, it's a $50 billion industry, so huge contribution to the GDP. It creates a lot of opportunities in the private sector. You have a lot of non-governmental investment, so pr government is responsible to invest in infrastructure, but at the same time, private organizations are investing in warehousing, distribution centers, and so forth. And you will have a lot of imports and exports with the help of logistics. So last couple of slides will give you an idea about the bigger picture. You see, this is an old silk route from which the goods were moving from Asia to Europe. Okay? But now we all hear about the new silk route. Okay? The new silk route is where the goods will flow from Asia to Europe. And in this new Silk Route, Saudi Arabia is going to play a very strategic role. It's very, very critical for Saudi Arabia to take a share within this trade. So you see, all these goods that's moving from Far East, whether from China, Hong Kong, Singapore, 
Indonesia and so forth, but all the way it passed through the Red Sea. Okay. And what Saudi Arabia is promoting now that these factories in China and in the Far East, they can set up their factories here on the Red Sea. So not everything will move from Far East. It can ship directly from Saudi Arabia all the way to Europe. So today, it's taking almost 60 days to take the goods from China to Europe. Tomorrow, you can ship within 7 to 10 days from here to Europe. That is why a lot of opportunities are going to be developed at the Red Sea and at the Arabian Gulf. Okay? And equally, it's not just uh, an area whereby men can get employed. And yes, it's highly dominated by men at the moment, uh, but there are plenty of opportunities for the female workforce to be employed in this sector. Okay? But if you go to the Europe, in this sector, male and females are working together. But at this point in time, in Saudi Arabia, it's highly dominated by males. But in future, I think the way we are seeing the trend, a lot of females will get employed in this sector. Okay? So if you go back to that first sheet about um, remember, now if I ask you the same question, probably you know much better than what we asked in the beginning of this session, right? So probably you have a much better understanding of how logistics sector is adding value to the national ecosystem, okay? My colleague, Michelle, will help you to understand from an SIDF perspective that how SIDF as an institution is helping to promote logistics within Saudi Arabia. Michelle? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So after we have understood the basics of logistics, so uh, let's highlight or let's talk about SIDF's role or contribution in this sector. So uh, before that, let me give you a, a brief highlight on SIDF, Saudi Industrial Development Fund, which was established in 1974. Uh, it's basically a government financial institution that provides soft loans to uh, industrial uh, organizations. When SIDF was established, the focus was on industry. And at that time, we were uh, supporting logistic projects, but with some uh, limitations. It has to be uh, related to the industry and with some other uh, limitations. Uh, SIDF's mandate was uh, updated and approved in 2018, in which the uh, portfolio of SIDF expanded to cover not only industry, but also to cover logistic services, mining, and renewables. So nowadays, SIDF supports many uh, logistic projects, uh, if it's related to the, to the industry or even it's related to other uh, sectors. However, currently our focus is on the 3BL mainly, and this is because we see uh, a gap in that area, and this gap needs to be uh, fulfilled, and here where SIDF's role uh, comes in. So uh, among logistics, and as my colleague Junaid mentioned, there are uh, many areas or many, uh, I would say, subsectors, such as warehousing, port infrastructure, uh, transportation, and some other uh, sectors. So SIDF has already uh, financed a number of uh, projects in that uh, area, such as rail transport projects, air cargo projects, cargo ships projects, port handling and infrastructure, as well as 3BL or third party logistics. So SIDF normally finances project finance, which means we finance the project itself. However, at the same time, 
we have some other offers such as working capital or uh, what we call it multi-purpose loan in which uh, a company that is already established wants to either expand their businesses or wants to make some improvements in a specific uh, area or uh, asset. And this is what we call it multi-purpose loan. Uh, working capital, it's, it's short-term loan, covers uh, operating exp uh, expenses such as manpower, such as raw materials, and this kind uh, of stuff. What I want to highlight here is that IDF is uh, frequently updating uh, the policy for uh, logistics, especially because we know that there is uh, a fast move of this sector, and because of that, we are updating our policy uh, on an annual basis, actually. So uh, this is what we have for today. So if anyone has any question, uh, either on logistics, supply chain, or even regarding IDF, we will be more than happy to answer it. Our brotherly competition with Dubai. We have brotherly competition with Bahrain, Abu Dhabi, Oman. All those regions are trying to build capability. Obviously, in the last 30 odd years, we did not pay enough attention in developing the capability in Saudi Arabia. And our neighboring markets have took that opportunity. So, if uh, Michelle, if you go back to this slide. Just furthermore, yes. Now look where the Dubai is. Dubai is somewhere here. Yeah. How come Dubai is basically becoming a route for all that transportation? I mean, imagine the complexity to go over here, mm -hmm. and then all the way from here to going to Europe. But Dubai was created because there were weaknesses in Saudi Arabia. So they created Jabal Ali Free Zone, Rashidiya Free Zone, Hamaria Free Zone, all these because of on our weaknesses. Bahrain has done the same. So on both ends, Bahrain and Dubai, taking a lot of opportunities of Saudi Arabia uh, from a logistics perspective. So what we are doing now, rather than confronting with them or challenging them, we are saying, fine, that's our weakness, but now it's our time to catch up as quickly as possible. So we are trying to build capabilities by sharing knowledge with you. So our resources are ready. SIDF is funding to the investors in Saudi Arabia. Uh, people like me are joining Saudi Arabian workforce, so quickly we can build up capabilities within Saudi Arabia to gain back our market share what we lost in the last 30, 40 years. It will not happen overnight, mm -hmm. but eventually. You know? I'll give you a small example. Like at the end of the day when you have your school examination, university examination, you get result. Some of you get first position, some of you get 10th position. Similarly, in the World Global Performance Index, our ranking is 67 out of 130 countries, okay? <coughs> Whereas Dubai is in top 10, okay? So imagine on one hand we will continue to improve our position, but that does not mean Dubai will sit back and relax. Mm -hmm. They will try to be in top five. So even much pressure on us. So geopolitics in any region, we have in MENA region, MENA region is mean to be politics, yeah, okay. okay? But it's not a time to confront rather than challenge each other with more capabilities and with skills and know-how rather than just by showing your muscles. Yeah, and, yeah, and in uh, a realization of this challenge and this fact, uh, you know, one of the main programs of Saudi Vision 2030 is NIDLIB, which is na National Industry 
and logistics uh, program which is focusing on uh, logistic as one of the main uh, areas of improvement. what happened in China, India, US, Europe. On the contrary, the GCC region in particular has managed the situation in a far much better way than those developed economies. People yeah. are rethinking the supply chain after the COVID. Certainly. People are more proactive in uh, adapting to new technologies and adapting to new procedures. I mean, honestly, ask yourself, in 2019 or 20, were you able to receive your grocery delivery at your doorstep? No. But look at the market dynamics now. Everything is coming to your doorstep in such a short span of time. This is a response from the market to the changing environment. And I think it's great. So you're saying that geopolitical unit is an advantage to Saudi Arabia and Phoenix or not? It is, I think. It's playing 100% in our favor. Our decisions, our approach, everything is in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I have a question. You encourage us to start our own logistics company. It's a discreet question. And establish <laughs> warehouses. those company one to two person are even working. So if I'm working alone, I have my own CR and I have a registered logistics company. In Saudi Arabia, here, the name of the game is different. Either you have to be with muscles or sit back, relax, and take your salary and go home. And that's what me and Michelle is doing. <laughs> uh, it's not easy, it's not easy. Okay, you have very stiff, very strong competition, and it's not easy. Unless until you have huge plots available, and you have a lot of cash sitting in the bank, and you don't know what to do. But we have seen people are even with hundreds of million, they take very cautious decisions when they invest in logistics. As I said in the beginning, you are making three to 4% profit on that. Okay? So, it's a very fine line. You can quickly lose your capital for the sake of a very small profit. Okay. Yeah, I mean, for any business, you have to have your pre-feasibility and then your feasibility study, and then you have to go through your core competency, and then you have to answer yourself why clients or customers will buy my product instead of others. So these are, I guess, three main areas where you need to look at before even taking the decision. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. So I guess with that point, we can conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shukran. Thank you, Shukran.